Hi, uh, my name is Conan Matharson, and here we're going to talk about uh, reviewing indications for using drugs in cardiology. And this is an overview of what we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about how to pick an antihypertensive, then a uh, couple indications for antiarrhythmics, how to treat a patient with angina, going along with that acute coronary syndrome therapy, and then chronic treatment for someone who's experienced a myocardial infarction or has coronary disease. Then we're going to switch gears to uh, heart failure and talk about how to treat acute decompensated heart failure, how to treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and finally uh, close up with some thoughts on lipid lowering therapy. So let's talk about antihypertensives. So this is the first of two slides on how to pick a drug for high blood pressure. And the first goal is to really deter determine what your goal blood pressure is. And here I just put 140 millimeters of mercury over 90 millimeters of mercury. Go with what uh, Dr. Paparello said in class. There are some evolving targets and, and uh, goals for treatment uh, for patients per perhaps with diabetes or coronary disease, uh, whether or not we should treat them as aggressively as we thought we should under JNC7. We're still waiting for JNC8. That should be coming out soon. So go with the goals that you learned in class. So whatever your goal is, which is usually around 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury or less, then you have to pick what medicine you need to use. And the way you pick a medicine is first think if the patient needs to be on a, a medicine that has blood pressure lowering effects for some other reason. And that's what we mean by a compelling indication. So all we mean is basically if they should be on a medicine for something else, pick that as their antihypertensives first and then see where you're at. So listed here are some of the compelling indications for various diseases, and what I've highlighted in red are what I think are kind of the most important in each of those categories. So uh, you'll learn a little bit more about most of these diseases uh, later on in this screencast and also uh, having learned them in lecture. But for example, a heart failure, uh, patients with heart failure could benefit from definitely an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker, or if they don't tolerate an ACE inhibitor, an ARB. Uh, selected patients benefit from an aldosterone antagonist and uh, a drug like thiazide or loop diuretic uh, can also lower blood pressure. Someone who's had a myocardial infarction could definitely benefit from an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker and perhaps depending on their ejection fraction after the myocardial infarction and aldosterone antagonist. Patients at high cardiovascular disease risk, these are the four that are listed on that uh, nice uh, JNC7 card that Dr. Paparello uh, put up on the website. I think among these, uh, they're all good choices. ACE inhibitors are the ones that perhaps specifically modify disease progression of coronary disease. That is to say, perhaps specifically lower um, progression of atherosclerosis. But the evidence for that is not great. Uh, so diabetes, again, uh, one of the major goals of diabetes treatment is protecting the kidneys. And ACE inhibitors and ARBs are really good, about, good at that. So those are really great choices for a diabetic. But all of these are good choices. Uh, chronic kidney disease, again, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are, are great choices and listed on the card as uh, thiazides and ACE inhibitors for recurrent stroke prevention. So if a patient has one of these indications, start with one of these medicines and see where you're at. So if they don't have a compelling indication, then you have to um, uh, decide what drug to start. And we decide whether or not to start one drug or two drugs uh, based on if they're stage one or stage two hypertensive. So advent cut points for deciding about stage one are 160 systolic and 100 millimeters of mercury diastolic. That's less than that is considered stage one. Above that is considered stage two. So if they are uh, stage one, then probably the best choices are a thiazide, an ACE inhibitor, or a calcium channel blocker. And thiazide diuretics are really um, probably the best choice among these, although they're all pretty good choices. Thiazides are very well tolerated and they are very cheap. Uh, and if someone has a, a blood pressure above 160 over 100 or, or so, um, starting two agents is a good idea because they're going to need at least two agents probably. Then what you do is you keep going adding agents as needed. So uh, let's just take a patient, let's say their blood pressure is 190 over 110 millimeters of mercury. Um, you might have to put them on four different antihypertensives. They might need an ACE inhibitor, a thiazide, a beta blocker, and a calcium channel blocker to get under control. Or maybe they're bradycardic, so you can't add the beta blocker. So that's when you would go on to move on to some of the other drugs that you learned about that are used as antihypertensives that aren't listed on this slide here. Those are considered sort of third or fourth line agents. A drug, for example, like hydralazine um, or a drug like clonidine 
or a drug like minoxidil, they're very, very effective antihypertensives, but dosing regimens and side effects sometimes limit uh, their use as um, first-line agents. So that's kind of how you pick uh, antihypertensives by thinking about what the compelling other indications are. The other aspect to picking a drug is thinking about what contraindications there are to other class, to certain of the drug classes. So think about the compelling indications and also the relative contraindications uh, that sort of rule out certain classes of drugs. So just listed here are a couple ideas. You know, hyperkalemia, you, you wouldn't want to pick an aldosterone antagonist. Bradycardia, you wouldn't want to pick a beta blocker. Someone with uncontrolled asthma, you wouldn't want to pick a beta blocker. And also, just as another caveat to note, that hydrochlorothiazide, if the creatinine is above 2 or so, doesn't tend to work very well. So that's antihypertensive therapy. And so now let's talk about how to pick an antiarrhythmic drug. And what I had tried to do in the screencast and also in class was sort of lump things together. But I think maybe that um, could have left some of you a little confused because it just seemed too generic and vague. So what I'm going to do here is spell things out in a little bit more detail uh, to talk about atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, AVNRT, AVRT, and ventricular tachycardia separately. So let's start with atrial fibrillation. And the main thing to know is first you have to decide what paradigm to choose. You have to choose rate control or rhythm control. And rate control or rhythm control are relatively equivalent strategies in terms of outcomes uh, as far as we know by clinical trials. The one thing to note, and we'll get to that in a little bit, is whatever you choose, the patient is still at thrombotic risk because rhythm control isn't perfect, for example. And uh, so you need to consider an antithrombotic medication like warfarin or aspirin. So rate control or rhythm control, you uh, have to consider antithrombotic therapy. And just remember that rate control means you're leaving the atria and atrial fibrillation and you're controlling how fast the ventricle goes. Rhythm control says that you're going to try and get the atrium into sinus rhythm. Shown here in gray, just as an aside, is uh, you know how we generally think in broad strokes about whether or not a patient ought to uh, go through rate control or rhythm control. So one thing is patient preference. If a patient um, has a strong preference one way or another, that can influence us. If they have a lot of symptoms in atrial fibrillation, sometimes we choose rhythm control. Patients who get rate control tend to be older patients with really big left atria, for example, many comorbidities and drugs. We don't think that getting back into a sinus rhythm is going to be really feasible. Um, so patients like that, we tend to use beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. These are AV nodal blockers, which block the ventricular response um, and slow down how fast beats are conducted in the ventricle. Rhythm control is typically employed in a patient who is highly symptomatic in atrial fibrillation. Some people really just can't stand the feeling of atrial fibrillation. Uh, Patients tend to be younger patients, relatively healthy hearts, otherwise the atria are not really enlarged. Uh, that's kind of one end of the spectrum, and that's probably most patients who end up in rhythm control. The other end of the spectrum is a patient who you think really uh, has a pretty sick heart. Maybe they have a lot of diastolic dysfunction and, or, or a lot of systolic dysfunction, and you think that you know, they could really benefit from having the atrial kick so that their, their heart is literally um, functioning on all cylinders. So a, a really sick patient. Uh, sometimes we really try hard to get them back into rhythm control if we think that's going to help their heart function better. So rhythm controlling agents, uh, what I want you to know is that class 1C and class 3 agents are best used for rhythm control. And um, in terms of a little bit more nitty gritty on how to pick a rhythm controlling agent, well class 1C agents, namely flecainide and propafenone, are really restricted to structurally normal hearts. And what we mean by that is when you do an echocardiogram, the heart looks essentially normal. Minimal um, enlargement, let's say, of the left atrium. The ventricle is squeezing just fine. Uh, it tends to be used in younger patients, class 1C agents. Amiodarone, dofetilide, and sotalol are class 3 agents, uh, which are useful in patients with structurally abnormal hearts, so low ejection fraction. Uh, or a really big left atrium or something like that. Or they can also be used in patients with normal hearts. Um, it's important to remember that you have to dose adjust dofetilide and so sotalol um, for the GFR. And you also have to monitor the QT um, corrected for dofetilide and sotalol uh, in patient while starting these medications because pre the QT prolongation for these medicines can pre predispose to torsade. Interestingly, amiodarone, even though it prolongs the QT interval, doesn't tend to predispose to torsade. Amiodarone is highly effective, so we like to use it, but it's usually just used in older patients, let's say patients who are you know, 65 or 70 um, or older, because there is a pretty high risk of relatively severe lung, liver, or thyroid uh, toxicities. 
uh, we generally quote patients about a 1% per year risk of each of these abnormalities. So this is not a therapy that you'd want to commit a, let's say, 40-year-old patient to. And among these drugs, ibutilide is the IV medication, and it's just used for acute cardioversion of atrial fibrillation. It's a class 3 antiarrhythmic. And the other aspect to uh, antiarrhythmic uh, therapy, or rather atrial fibrillation therapy, is an antithrombotic either with warfarin in patients with higher risk of a thrombus, which you can imagine are older patients, a bigger left atrium, a sicker ventricle, someone who's already had a stroke before, um, someone in heart failure, or in patients who let's just say, are relatively healthy otherwise, uh, aspirin 325 milligrams a day can suffice. And so the details of which to pick aren't important at this stage, but just keep an eye out for the CHAD score, which is a way of formalizing uh, assessment of thrombotic risk and choosing antithrombotic therapy. Okay, so that's atrial fibrillation. Here's atrial flutter. And it's treated uh, in broad strokes very similarly to atrial fibrillation for both, again, for atrial flutter, it's not listed on the slide, but you want to make sure that the patient is on some form of an antithrombotic therapy because there is a clot risk with atrial flutter as well. Okay, so what you want to do is um, consider rate control. That's a possibility with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. But for uh, because of the um, nature of the arrhythmia, for whatever reason, it's very notoriously difficult to rate control atrial flutter, but it can be done, so and it's an acceptable strategy. Rhythm control, again, you can use some of the agents we talked about for atrial fibrillation, but really rhythm control for atrial flutter is best achieved by catheter ablation of that uh, isthmus or that structure that sort of connects the tricuspid valve and the inferior vena cava because that's a really small area and it's, it's a pretty straight shot and a relatively easy ablation type procedure to undertake. So that's really the best therapy for atrial flutter, the typical type of atrial flutter that you learn about here. Okay, AVNRT, the reentrant arrhythmia within the AV node leading to near simultaneous activation of the ventricle and the atria. So acute termination of AVNRT uh, is usually achieved with adenosine uh, that creates a transient heart block. That also helps you diagnose the narrow complex tachyrhythmias if you're having trouble teasing them apart. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers intravenously can also be used for acute termination of AVNRT. So chronic treatment, um, you can really choose uh, to do try to do a catheter ablation or um, if the patient is minimally symptomatic, uh, try to use an AV nodal blocking agent to mess the reentrant arrhythmia up. And in clinical practice, what we most often use are beta blockers, but you can also use calcium channel blockers and digoxin. So uh, that's AVNRT therapy. AVRT therapy uh, gets a little tricky because um, if the patient is in, a, is in an antidromic AVRT, that can look like a wide complex tachycardia and really what your first cognitive step is to make sure that it's not a ventricular tachycardia and you don't want to be treating, um, you don't want to be treating ventricular tachycardia uh, with, with drugs that uh, you think are treating AVRT because then you can really hurt the patient. So, if it's a narrow complex AVRT, I think adenosine uh, is a reasonable choice. But if it's wide complex, you have to be very careful that it's not a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, and again, the rhythm control aspects of this get very, very complicated, I think, are beyond the level of what you need to understand here. But the pathophysiology to understand is that slowing down the AV node could be dangerous because you could speed up conduction down the uh, accessory pathway or the bypass tract. However, you know, in gray here is that AV nodal blockers can also be used in conjunction with flecainide or propafenone for rhythm control in AVRT. That's ten, that tends to be a reasonable combination if you know that the wide complex, uh, if you know that it's AVRT that you're treating. Okay, so that's AVRT. Now let's move on to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And the three drugs I really want you to know about, uh, there are a lot of drugs that can be used for ventricular tachycardia, but I do want you to know that amiodarone, sotalol, and lidocaine are really the most useful drugs uh, that were uh, that you can treat ventricular tachycardia with. And just recall, before we get into the specifics of how to pick one of these drugs, that what we're really trying to do is use them as an adjunct to defibrillators. Because if someone has ventricular tachycardia, let's say because they have a low ejection fraction, the best therapy for them is really to have a defibrillator. That way, if they do go into VT, they can get a shock and get out of VT. But if the patient is getting a lot of shocks, has a high burden of ventricular tachycardia, it's not very pleasant. So oftentimes we'll use these medicines 
to uh, adjunctively to try and minimize the amount of uh, of burden. Okay, so the specifics of the drugs. So when a patient is in the hospital, let's say uh, either with myocardial infarction or you know they have chronic uh, heart failure and they happen to come in with a lot of ventricular tachycardia, the first line drug we tend to use is amiodarone. And that can be used as an IV medication or a peel medicine. So that tends to be used in the acute setting as a first line. As sort of a second line, but also commonly used as lidocaine because uh, it can be very useful in acute myocardial infarction. Uh, but either of those are reasonable choices. So in terms of chronic therapy, um, the choices that you have are really uh, oral amiodarone, suffering from the same limitations we talked about. Um, but generally, if someone is sick enough to have a low EF and um, ventricular tachycardia, we feel that the, the benefits of amiodarone uh, justify the risks and the side effects. Uh, Sotalol, again, is a useful medication for ventricular tachycardia in, um, in the chronic setting. And the, the analog that's oral is mixelatine for, um, as a class 1B agent, which can also be used, but it tends to be used less frequently. Okay, so also important to know are because our flecainide and propafenone are contraindicated uh, for ventricular tachycardia. These are the class 1C antiarrhythmics. And just shown here in gray are that class 1A agents can also be used, but they're used kind of rarely. And so distinct from monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is torsad, uh, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia in the setting of long QT interval. Um, and the main idea here is that you want to try and uh, shorten up the QT interval and drugs that help you do that are drugs that are things that speed up your heart, for example, isoproteinol and overdrive pacing. But also phenytoin turns out is an antiarrhythmic that is useful in torsade. Magnesium, through an unknown mechanism, tends to stabilize the, uh, the membrane of the heart. And of course, shock to try and get the patient out of torsade. So that's antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Now we're going to move on to a block uh, focusing on coronary disease. And so first, I just wanted to lay out conceptually this really important concept of a continuum of angina acuity. And listed here are four different sort of broad categories of angina. So there's chronic stable angina, unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, really important to know, but not listed on this slide, is variant or Prinz metals type angina, because that doesn't necessarily depend on the underlying pathology of atherosclerosis. That's more vasospasm. Okay, so the first way we divide these is chronic stable angina uh, as distinct from acute coronary syndrome. So chronic stable angina pathologically is characterized by an atherosclerotic lesion that's a fixed obstruction, a stable plaque with a thick cap and no thrombus. Uh, History-wise, the patient might present with stable exertional angina. So doc, you know, I walk up three flights of stairs and then I get chest pain. Uh, there are no real resting ST changes or T wave changes on the EKG. Uh, you may get EKG changes when the patient is on the treadmill uh, and doing a stress test, but importantly, you may not either. Uh, there is a reasonably high false negative rate with just a straight EKG stress test. That's why we often add imaging to stress, stress tests. Troponin, well, there's no infarction, so there shouldn't really be uh, any troponin, although people can have a uh, normal troponin of up to like, let's say 0.03 nanograms per milliliter, or 0.05 nanograms per milliliter, but really it should be close to zero. Just listed here is a web link for more information spelling this out if, if you would like some. So um, acute coronary syndrome is the other sort of presentation for angina, and that's the more acute one, and so that's shown by being higher up on the spectrum here, more red. And we divide that into a broad category of ST elevation MI, and then we lump together unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI into one category. As we'll see in a minute, the downstream management of that is pretty similar. So let's first talk about ST elevation MI. And uh, all of these are, are characterized by a rac rapidly progressive obstruction, an unstable plaque, thrombus formation uh, from a thin cap, ST elevation MI, pathologically is characterized by a total occlusion of an epicardial vessel, um, and that results in ST elevations on the electrocardiogram. So patients with this uh, syndrome, acute Cori syndrome in general, have typically rest angina or angina with very minimal exertion or angina that has increased in, in uh, 
in frequency that we call it crescendo angina. So instead of three blocks, it's three steps or something like that that gets some chest pain. Um, so all of that is just sort of lumped into rest pain here. Um, and it's important to know that sometimes patients have very atypical symptoms. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have chest pain with angina. They could have shortness of breath or indigestion, jaw pain, tooth pain even I've seen. Uh, so it's, it's very possible to, to have other things happen besides chest pain. Okay, so ST elevation MI, you get these ST elevations and you have very markedly elevated troponin elevation because you have a lot of myocardial necrosis. So uh, unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI, uh, although it's the same similar sort of pathophysiology in terms of plaque rupture, the thrombus isn't necessarily totally occluding the epicardial vessel, or alternatively, uh, it embolizes and you get uh, downstream short showering and um, complete occlusion of very much smaller branch vessels. So uh, that's all lumped under the idea of near total thrombus. By definition, so by definition, there are no ST elevations in non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina because that would just tip you into ST elevations. And um, you may have T wave inversions, ST depressions, and since there's a broad continuum within unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI, you can uh, have a broad continuum or variability in EKG changes ranging from essentially no EKG changes at all to some minimal T wave inversions to ST depressions, to marked ST depressions. So the more EKG changes you have, uh, the more severe they are in the order I just laid out, uh, the more severe of a acute coronary syndrome they have, but it's lumped into this broad category. And similar to the EKG changes, you can have um, a broad variety of troponin presentations. So you can have no troponin elevation. You can have a minimal troponin elevation, which is below the diagnostic cup point for a myocardial infarction, which at Northwestern we define as 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, although that definition can vary from institution to institution, to a pretty abnormal troponin that exceeds the diagnostic cup point for myocardial infarction, which here is 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, up to let's just say 20 or 30 nanograms per milliliter. Um, it can be just as high as for STEMI, although STEMIs tend to have a higher troponin elevation if they, the natural history of it is allowed to progress such that they don't get intervened upon. You can have troponins in the, in the hundreds. Um, can be a really big infarct. Okay, so this is like the um, pathology history, EKG changes, and troponin changes of these uh, four sort of elements of the spectrum of angina and, acute, and coronary artery disease. So the treatment for all of these uh, reflects the uh, severity of the underlying disease state. So the intensity of treatment goes with how severe the disease state is. The underlying premise for treatment of all coronary disease is aggressive risk factor modification. Ideally, we prevent coronary disease, right? We prevent it from even occurring um, in population strategies, but once a patient has one of these, by definition, it's secondary prevention or even tertiary prevention. You want to make sure they're exercising, weight loss, smoking cessation, and uh, management of lipids and diabetes. Uh, okay, so let's say the patient has chronic st stable angina. We'll go through each of these in the next slide. Uh, broadly speaking, you can choose to try to treat that with medications, so anti-anginal medicines, uh, percutaneous intervention to relieve the obstruction, or maybe bypass surgery if they need it. So let's go to STEMI next. Um, the, the main idea with an ST elevation MI is that you want to open up the artery quickly, and that's done with either an emergent percutaneous intervention or thrombolytics. Unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI, there is uh, reflecting the continuum even within this uh, subcategory. There is a continuum of treatment choices. Uh, patients who are at lower risk, it may be reasonable to choose non-invasive risk stratification. That means basically uh, let's say they, they have no troponin elevation, no EKG changes, minimal pain. You wait until everything goes away, make sure they didn't have a heart attack, and then send them to the stress lab to see uh, how much myocardium is at risk, and then decide whether or not to do an angiogram. Or what's just most commonly done in almost uh, most people with acute coronary syndrome is an early invasive strategy, uh, which is to say try to send them to angiography and PCI within 24 hours. And we'll see that Management of this gets complicated, but I'll try and uh, keep it in broad strokes for you. Okay, so therapy for patients with angina. So this is on the left end of that spectrum there. And so 
the main thing or one of the main things to do is anti-ischemic therapy. So beta blockers being the mainstay of that. Uh, and also these other anti-ischemic drugs, calcium channel blockers, nitrates, and ronolazine. The other thing to consider uh, and to definitely do is to treat with an antiplatelet agent, which is usually aspirin. Uh, if the patient doesn't tolerate aspirin, a drug like clopidogrel or another thenopyridine is usually used um, as an antiplatelet therapy. And then the third main pillar is lipid-lowering therapy, a statin for a goal LDL cholesterol of less than 100 or, or even less than 70 millimeters milligrams per deciliter. And the fourth aspect of treatment for a patient with coronary disease is an ACE inhibitor. Uh, not everyone treats with an ACE inhibitor, but certainly there is some evidence to suggest that an ACE inhibitor in an arm can directly affect coronary artery disease progression, so that's why that's sometimes employed. So remember these four classes of medicines, or uh, four classes with anti-ischemics, and then four other, four broad pictures, broad choices for treatment with angina. Acute treatment for my, uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. So a patient comes into the emergency room crushing chest pain, four millimeter ST elevations in, let's say, leads two, three, and AVF. So MONA is a great mnemonic to understand and remember what sort of the um, upfront therapy for all acute coronary syndrome is. So morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin. Uh, this is to relieve um, pain, which can lower um, sympathetic activation, oxygen to theoretically improve oxygenation of tissues, nitrates, which will uh, help reduce you know, preload and reduce myocardial oxygen demand, and aspirin, uh, which can uh, serve an anti-thrombotic purpose. Beta blockers can um, also be used, should be used uh, to decrease oxygen demand while you're waiting for the patient to undergo reperfusion, and we choose primary percutaneous intervention um, or going right to the cath lab or thrombolysis. PCI is preferred uh, if you have it available, and thrombolysis if you, do, if you don't um, um, have PCI. And choosing one or the other gets a little bit complicated, but basically no PCI or thrombolysis. PCI is probably preferable. Uh, the other things that are added are other antithrombotic agents, heparin uh, and clopidogrel or another thenopyridine. And while the patient is getting the PCI, adding a 2B3A inhibitor. Um, so you can see that the patient is on a whole bunch of drugs to interdict uh, the throm thrombotic pathway, aspirin, heparin, clopidogrel, 2B3A inhibitors. OK, acute treatment of a non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina. So this gets complicated. As you can see, there are more words on the slide, but I'll walk you through it. So again, MONA, so this is sort of the mainstay, the basis of what you're doing once the patient presents. Then remember, um, you're not going to take the patient to an emergent cath, so you have a little bit more time. And so you definitely want to put the person on an anticoagulant, and the two choices to remember are heparin or a low molecular weight heparin, specifically anoxaparin, because that has the highest evidence around it. Um, so. They're, they're relatively equivalent. There might be a little bit more data supporting anoxaparin, um, but bivalarudin or fondaparinux have sort of emerging indications for this, which uh, we won't really discuss further, but just know that you might next year see some patients who go to the emergency room and then get started on bivalarudin. Okay, and then the next thing you want to do is make sure that the patient is uh, relatively chest pain free, and you want to use beta blockers, nitrates, and morphine as needed for chest pain. Okay, so now the patient is, uh, you know, has come up to the CCU, let's say, from the emergency room, and the next thing that you want to decide is whether or not to give the patient clopidogrel. And the evidence truly supports giving clopidogrel upstream, that is to say, way before they have their angioplasty and stent put in. But uh, realistically, it's institution-dependent uh, because there is this idea that suppose the person needs bypass surgery, and you administer clopidogrel, it will take five days before the drug wears away to a level that's low enough such that bypass surgery is safe. So truly it's institution dependent, but we tend to do it here. So clopidogrel, uh, chest pain relief with beta blockers, nitrates, morphine, uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin, aspirin. I think that's uh, pretty standard. So the next thing is to choose what your strategy is going to be. Um, are you going to do early invasive, which means are you going to um, take the patient to the cath lab as soon as it's next open. So that really means 
PCI in the next 24 hours, or you're going to do a conservative strategy at someone who is lower risk, uh, negative electrocardiogram, negative troponin, and you're going to do a stress test to see if angiography is needed. So truly, everyone who you believe um, has plaque rupture, most of the time we choose an early invasive strategy, uh, but we employ a conservative strategy very rarely uh, for patients where we really feel that there is an obstructive lesion and it's an acute coronary syndrome. What you'll often see in the hospital, and don't get confused with this, is a patient with very sort of borderline atypical chest pain where you're not sure that it's acute coronary syndrome and you send them to a stress test to, to sort of rule out uh, an obstruction that's a little bit different. Um, so let's just say we choose early invasive, we think it's a big thrombosis, and certainly the patients with EKG changes and troponin elevations uh, are gonna go for an angiogram. Uh, you're gonna add a 2B3 inhibitor on at the time of angiography, uh, in addition to the clopidogrel, uh, because they're gonna need that for their stent, and of course the aspirin, which they're also gonna need for their stent. Um, so it's really like triple antiplatelet therapy. Conservative strategy is uh, in lower risk patients like we talked about, you do a stress test to see if angiography is needed. Okay, so that gets a little confusing, but I think if you think through it, it'll make sense. It's really just based on how severe their disease presentation is. And going along with that sort of concept of continuity or continuum of disease severity, let's just say, you know, it's Friday night and the patient is, um, has come up to the floor and you've put them on uh, aspirin, let's say anoxaparin, uh, beta blockers, nitrates, and morphine, uh, clopidogrel, uh, and they're still having EKG changes, still having a little bit of troponin, uh, still having troponin elevations, maybe a little bit of chest pain. Uh, then what you can do is perhaps add on a 2B3A inhibitor. Uh, and we, we just clinical shorthand, we say, oh, that patient has coronary disease very hot. Like they're, it's flared up, it's on fire, and, uh, and you're trying to passivate it or cool it down then you might do a 2B3A inhibitor upstream. So a lot of this is a lot of detail, but what I really want you to understand is uh, MONA, uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin, chest pain relief, uh, clopidogrel, and uh, probably angiography. That's really the bottom line for acute treatment of non ST elevation MI or unstable angina. Okay, now let's talk about chronic treatment of unstable angina, unstable uh, non ST elevation MI or ST elevation MI. So the patient has come to your hospital, has gotten their angiogram, and now they're getting ready for discharge. And what medicines do they need to be on chronically? Obviously, they're not going to go on an IV 2B3 inhibitor home. So what medicines should they be on? Well, uh, aspirin for sure. Uh, they should for sure be on athenopyridine, a dual antiplatelet therapy like clopidogrel. Um, and that's really for two indications. One indication is because if they had a stent put in, uh, they should be on that medication, but also for the indication of non-ST elevation MI or ST elevation MI itself. The only caveat to this as an aside is for the minority of patients who end up getting bypass surgery, uh, they probably don't end up going home on clopidogrel. Um, they should be on a statin medication invariably regardless of lipid levels. Uh, Again, we want to ideally treat to an LDL of less than 100 milligrams uh, per deciliter or an LDL of 70 milligrams per deciliter, a beta blocker, and an ACE inhibitor or an ARB uh, because of the beneficial effects both on the myocardium in the setting of a patient who's had a myocardial infarction and for the potential beneficial effects on direct progression of coronary artery disease. And again, the beta blocker, the rationale is for a patient who has had a myocardial infarction um, to help prevent the heart from negatively remodeling. Now, um, a patient who has just had unstable angina without a frank MI, I suppose it's debatable if they ought to be on a beta blocker, but that's a finer point. Okay, now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about heart failure treatment. And what we'll do is start with acute decompensated heart failure, which is a syndrome of high wedge pressure, essentially. And when we're talking about acute decompensated heart failure, what we're really talking about is failure of the left ventricle. I recall you can have right ventricular failure independent of left ventricular failure. For example, if some, let's just say pulmonary stenosis, then the right ventricle could get really sick. Um, and then you could get right-sided symptoms like uh, peripheral edema. But more often than not, um, what we're trying to deal with is the left ventricle. And so we're talking about symptoms of pulmonary edema, but then also people can get peripheral edema because the most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. 
So this is borrowed from Dr. Shah, uh, and I think it's a really great slide to help conceptualize um, the axes along which we think about patients with heart failure. So on the x-axis here is shown perfusion, and the y-axis is shown congestion. And uh, so you can divide patients into four groups. One group, the group of patients who are warm and dry, probably don't have heart failure, right? Because they're well perfused and they don't, they're not volume overloaded. So where's the heart failure? So reconsider the diagnosis in that group. That's easy. The group of patients who are well perfused and are wet um, are the patients who, uh, you know, may have a normal or high blood pressure, but they're still volume overloaded. So that's one kind of presentation. Another presentation is a patient who's volume overloaded but is cold, that is to say not very well perfused. And an end stage type of presentation is a patient who is uh, volume, their volume is compensated, but they're still cold. And shown here are the percentages of how often these presentations are seen with acute decompensated heart failure. So this is again adapted from Dr. Shah's slide. What I've done here is sort of list, uh, like Dr. Shah did, the um, broad strategy of what to do in each of these bins, and then on the right, the medications that fit with those strategies. Okay, so the, the sort of most straightforward or easiest thing to deal with is a patient who is normotensive or hypertensive even, and volume overloaded. Well, what you can do there, since you have room, is to diurese them, for sure, but also uh, uptitrate their heart failure medicines because that will ultimately be what modifies their degree, disease progression. Uh, you're not limited by blood pressure, and you can use the hop hospitalization as an opportunity to improve their medical regimen. Patients who are cold and wet, what you need to do is first try to uh, improve their systemic perfusion. And so the first thing that you try to do is try vasodilators to help um, reduce afterload and indeed reduce preload, thereby perhaps improving uh, myocardial function, and then try and diurese them. Now, you might be stuck. You might not have enough, uh, you might not be able to administer the vasodilators because you're limited by blood pressure. In that case, you're, you may be forced to use inotropes in order to support um, cardiac output in order to be able to diurese the patient. So the most typical inotrope used is dobutamine. The patient who's cold and dry is really end-stage heart failure. Um, you can try the vasodilators and the inotropes, but you may also need to consider a left ventricular assist device or transplant. Okay, so what are there different medicines in the different bins here? So diuresis, the main thing that we try um, the mainstay of diuretic therapy is loop diuretics, so furosemide, torsemide, or bumetanide. Uh, adjunctive to those typically used in the hospital are, um, a, if you need to sort of potentiate the loop diuretic, is adding on another um, medicine which blocks sodium resorption in the nephron. So a thiazide diuretic is probably the most commonly used sort of adjunct, a drug like metolazone. An aldosterone antagonist is often used, or a patient with high bicarbonate, acetazolamide is often used. So for a patient um, who uh, you need to try vasodilators for, the best choice if they're really sick and you want to use an IV medication to drop their preload and or afterload quickly is nitroglycerin or nitroprusside. So a patient who is very short of breath, these are often used. Um, and um, an ACE inhibitor and ARB are also good vasodilators, and hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate are also good vasodilators. So uh, these medications are considered. And then when we're talking about uptitrating heart failure medications, we're talking about evidence-based therapy that uh, reduces symptoms and mortality from uh, left ventricular um, systolic dysfunction, if that's what they have, or unfortunately with left ventricular, like diastolic dysfunction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Unfortunately, there isn't much evidence-based therapy. But uh, what we're talking about is uptitrating the ACE inhibitor, the ARB, the beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist um, and or the hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. And again, the inotropes we can choose are dobutamine. And maybe digoxin can be used in patients, um, as we'll see in a little bit. Another good mnemonic for this is that LMNOP mnemonic. I'm sure I don't know what it is, but I know Dr. Shah had it in his slides, and um, it was in Lilly. I know there's morphine, nitrate, uh, positive pressure ventilation, oxygen. And I'm going to guess L is for loop diuretics. Okay. Chronic medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So the patient has now made it through their episode of acute decompensated heart failure. You're sending them home. Uh, perhaps you're following up with them in clinic, and you're trying to make sure they're on the medicines that are going to reduce their mortality. So beta blockers for everyone, 
And these are the three evidence-based choices, metoprolol, succinate, bisoprolol, and carvedilol. Um, these are the drugs with clinical trial data supporting their benefit um, in heart failure. And it's important to just distinguish, distinguish metoprolol succinate, which is the once a day formulation, S for single, from metoprolol tartrate, the twice a day formulation, T for twice or two. Um, so it's succinate that's better than tartrate. So everyone gets a beta blocker. Everyone gets an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, again, for um, its afterload reduction and potentially its direct effects on the myocardium. Diuretics, although there isn't um, you know, evidence to support a reduction in mortality with diuretics, you, we very often need them to control volume. And usually it's a loop diuretic that's used. Uh, for patients with class 2 or 3 symptoms and an EF less than about 35%, uh, an aldosterone antagonist should be used. Hydralazine, an arteriolar vasodilator, and nitrates, um, a venodilator. Uh, there is evidence for benefit in all pop populations, but the strongest evidence is in African-American patients. So um, using hydralazine and nitrate as afterload reduction is a good choice. Uh, also, in patients who can't tolerate ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, using these as afterload reduction makes sense. Digoxin uh, can be considered. It has a narrow therapeutic window and helps reduces, reduce morbidity and hospitalizations, but doesn't have a benefit or on mortality and heart failure with re reduced ejection fraction. As Dr. Shah mentioned, um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you want to try to do volume control and blood pressure control, but unfortunately there's no evidence-based neurohormonal therapy that is going to help uh, retard disease progression. Okay, so that's treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now we'll just close up with lipid-lowering therapy. And when we're talking about lipid-lowering therapy, we're talking about treating LDL cholesterol, trying to get it lower, treating HDL cholesterol, trying to get it higher, and treating triglycerides, trying to get it lower. So what are the indications for treating high LDL cholesterol? And these are from the ATP3 guidelines. ATP4 is coming out soon. Uh, and these are modified and simplified, so it's important to note that the, the true guidelines are a little bit more complex than this, and probably practice has sort of moved a little bit beyond the guidelines uh, while we're waiting for the new ones. So one thing that's certain is that a patient with coronary disease or coronary disease risk equivalent, um, namely diabetes, symptomatic coronary, carotid disease, peripheral arterial disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm, or a greater than 20% coronary heart disease risk by 10-year Framingham uh, risk estimation should have an LDL goal of less than 100 millimeters of mercury and perhaps as an alternative goal less than 70 milli milligrams per deciliter. I didn't mean to say millimeters per mercury. We tend to add on in clinical practice chronic kidney disease as well because in the last 10 years uh, we've noted that kidney disease is a very, very powerful risk factor for developing coronary disease independent of hypertension or diabetes or any of the other stuff that can cause both chronic kidney disease or coronary disease. So these patients, LDL less than 100 or 70. If the patient doesn't have a coronary disease uh, risk equivalent or coronary disease, then uh, you look at their risk factors. You look at smoking, hypertension, uh, family history of premature coronary disease or age defined as greater than 45 for a man or greater than 55 for a woman. And if the patient has two uh, or more coronary heart disease risk factors, you try to treat to an LDL of less than 130. The patient has zero to one risk factors, treating to an LDL of less than 160 makes sense. And again, the same therapeutic concept of uh, higher risk merits uh, more aggressive therapy than lower risk. And that's the concept here. So how do you lower LDL cholesterol? And here's basically the approach. Um, clearly, clearly from a, a preponderance of evidence, statin medications are clearly the first line for lowering LDL cholesterol. And so we use the phrase maximally tolerated statin dose. So uh, that means basically you try to get the patient on as much statin as possible um, to achieve your LDL goal before considering a second-line therapy. Now, second-line therapy for LDL lowering is controversial. I would say that the weight of the evidence supports using a bile acid resin as the best second-line treatment, but truly there isn't great data for any of these choices. Um, bile acid resins are often poorly tolerated because of GI upset and bloating, 
But if the patient tolerates it, I think it's a great choice. Colocevalim is probably the most modern uh, agent. The other choices are niacin and azetamide, but we need more data to make those um, recommendations more definitively. So statin first, then consider these other adjunctive therapies. So treating low HDL cholesterol is a little bit dissatisfying because currently there's no evidence-based therapy for lowering HDL, treating low HDL cholesterol. That is to say, raising it doesn't necessarily improve mortality. Um, in fact, recent basic science evidence, which we won't go into uh, from Mendelian randomization trials, suggests that it's not HDL cholesterol that matters. So genetic variants that affect your HDL cholesterol don't affect your coronary disease risk. So if it's causative, how does that happen? That's the basic idea. So maybe it's not HDL cholesterol that we need to be treating, but maybe we need to be improving flux through the pathway to improve reverse cholesterol transport. That's a concept anyway. But if you want to raise HDL cholesterol, the best drug for that is niacin. Now what about high triglycerides? Triglycerides are also associated with coronary disease risk, so higher triglycerides are correlated with higher risk. Uh, but is it clear that lowering triglycerides lowers coronary risk? Uh, that's not completely clear. Um, there are dr fibrate drugs do a good job of lowering triglycerides, and there is evidence that fibrates may lower coronary disease risk. But in the era of statins, um, uh, it, it's not clear that fibrates are better. So, so we don't know if lowering triglycerides for the indication of coronary disease makes sense or not. I think from a practical standpoint, first check if the patient doesn't make sure the patient doesn't have diabetes or hypothyroidism because those are two very common things that happen um, that really raise triglyceride levels. So a normal upper limit of normal for triglycerides is 150 milligrams per deciliter. And you can have a patient come in with a lipid panel with a triglyceride of 400 milligrams per deciliter, and then you find out that their, an uncon their diabetes is uncontrolled. And if you get the diabetes under control with insulin or oral agents, you'll bring the triglycerides down. Same thing with hypothyroidism. So check for those. But if the patient has a triglyceride above 500 milligrams per deciliter, uh, there's a high risk of pancreatitis, and I think in those patients, definitely treating with fibrates or omega-3 fatty acids makes a lot of sense to lower triglycerides. So just to reemphasize uh, for lipids, by far the most important thing uh, is LDL cholesterol, which is king, um, and statin medications is best for that. Second line, LDL lowering is controversial. There's no evidence-based treatment for uh, low HDL and treating high triglycerides somewhat controversial, but certainly very high triglycerides you want to reduce. So just a couple things we haven't covered in these screencasts. Know the important drug interactions. Stat these are just some of them that came to mind. Statins and fibrates, statins and grapefruit juice, amiodarone and morphin. Uh, you could add digoxin and potassium to the list. So important interactions in cardiovascular medicine because there are a few. And also no important side effects of the medications. Um, these are some of the things that weren't covered in the screencast. Um, and so there are a lot of drugs. I hope these reviews were helpful. And thank you very much.